Seeking now the help of God, let's turn to that passage in his word from which we were reading. That's Exodus chapter 16, and we'll take our text for tonight in the words of verse 12. Exodus 16, and taking our text in verse 12. Let's hear the word of the Lord. I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. The abundance of Elam had given way once more to the trials of the wilderness. So it is in this world. That is the normal course and pattern. We do not dwell in heaven here. Sweet times, times of rich and abundant spiritual harvest and provision are not the norm. Times of trial, times of testing, times of spiritual lack. These things are the norm, and it is how we respond in these days of trial and difficulty that the true character is revealed and made evident. And sadly, it is a poor picture of Israel that is given in this solemn passage, murmuring against God. How fearful. The Hebrew word carries a deeper significance than merely complaining, grumbling. It is rebelling. It is mutiny that is described here. Here is the complaint of those who are throwing off Obedience to their God and respect to him. It is a spiritual hardness and a spirit of backsliding coming forth. Oh, we may well search ourselves. In difficult and challenging days, how are we responding? By nature, man is hungry. There's spiritual lesson even in the constant daily need of the physical body for sustenance. We are being taught our need and our dependence. How much more in spiritual things and how much more as regards the far profounder hunger of the soul, which again is natural to the state of man. Man is a hungry being, hungry for God. Wasn't it Augustine who spoke of the God-shaped hole in the heart of man? That need of man for the comfort, for the sweet provision that only a holy God can give. And yet if that is so for unregenerate man, how much more so is it for regenerate man? For having once tasted the goodness of God, having once received his salvation, Oh, we need more, don't we? Wasn't I saying just this morning that in effectual calling, that embrace whereby we are persuaded and enabled to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel, that's not just once. That's an ongoing, a permanent state of embrace. And the true child of God walks close with his Lord. The true child of God needs, consciously depends upon God. And so the true child of God must feed regularly upon God. Well, friend, are you looking elsewhere to satisfy that hunger? Are you forgetting your God? Are you forgetting the sweetness and the comfort that once you knew in these strange days where we're apart from one another and apart from public worship? Are you starting to turn towards the world to try to satisfy your spiritual emptiness? 
Are you looking to the things of this life? Are you putting your trust in doctors, in medicine, in politics, in current affairs? Are you putting your hope in entertainment, as so many seem to in our day, filling their heads with what is vacuous and trivial, in an almost conscious effort to blot out that which is lasting and significant and eternal? Oh, may it not be so. May it not be so. Man is hungry. But oh, praise God. Our God is abundant in his provision. Our Saviour Jesus Christ declares to us, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Oh, that we would be found feeding upon Christ this night, that we would taste and see that he is good, that who trusts in him is blessed. Well, take up this passage then, consider it more broadly. Under that theme, God's provision for man's hunger. God's provision for man's hunger. And let's firstly see the complaint of hunger. It might be we're inclined to be somewhat sympathetic to Israel. It's no easy thing to be hungry, for the body to be crying out for sustenance. The sin wasn't in the hunger. The sin wasn't in the felt need. It's good to be hungry. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you know that your hunger is a need for God, a need for the experience of fellowship and of atonement with him, a need for assurance of the pardon of your sins and of that inheritance that awaits the children of God in heaven being for you, if you know that, that is good. That hunger is a commendable thing. Let it drive you to the Saviour. But oh, there was sin, sin hunger. We see that brought out very clearly for us in Psalm 78, which acts as a kind of commentary to this passage and opens out broader aspects to it, showing a fuller picture of the sin and also a fuller picture of the judgment of God upon it than we gather from the relatively brief account which we have in Exodus 16. And when we come to such passages, it's important to remember that Psalm 78 is every bit as inspired, therefore every bit as historically reliable, therefore every bit as instructive as Exodus 16, and well worthy also of reflection and consideration. But for now, I'd like to direct your attention particularly to verse 3 of Exodus 16, where we have the complaint of the Israelites expressed for us. Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the fool. Oh, it's funny what a different picture of Egypt it seems to be now. The dead children floating in the river are all forgotten. They're remembering flesh pots. And truly, if there were flesh pots in Egypt, if there was much in the way of rich food provided for the Israelites, was it not merely to give them the strength to work all the harder in their slave labour for Pharaoh? Oh, the memory can put a rosy glow even upon dark days, and it's important that we never sink into the mistake of glamorising our past sinful lives or looking back with nostalgic eyes to the days when we were in the world. Let's remember the emptiness. Let's remember the guilt and shame of the morning after. Let's remember the deadness that we felt in these days. Oh, praise God who brought us out of the house of bondage. So there is sin here. Would to God we had died. They say, what a terrible thing. 
What a terrible thing to say. God has spared them. God has brought them forth with a mighty hand. God has given them their lives when I pray. And they're saying, would to God that we had died. Oh, it's a fearful response, isn't it? They are hungry. Hungry for a matter of days. And they are expressing such intensity of despair. But you know, it's quite familiar to us. If we look at this world around us, you'll see that despair altogether evident in the world. What is it that fires this whole movement for euthanasia, which has so taken off in our day? Assisted suicide, physician assisted suicide, how important that is to give people a dignified death, these meaningless, empty phrases that people use. It's a culture of despair, isn't it? Our gods have been taken from us. We made a god of the things of this life, of freedom, of the enjoyment of luxuries, of the satisfaction of physical desires, and now suddenly our life is restricted to a bedroom, perhaps. Suddenly our control over our own bodies is restricted. Suddenly our horizons are narrowed and limited. And there's nothing left. Behold your gods. Your gods are taken from you. They are dead gods. What's left but despair? Death. It's fearful, isn't it? Put your hope in the pleasures of this world. And in an instant, maybe an accident that leaves paralyzed, maybe a horrible condition like motor neuron disease, leaving you wheelchair bound. And is that it? Is that your joy taken? Is that your contentment removed? Is that your God's toppled? If you are reduced, if you are limited to one room, to one wheelchair. Well, friend, consider that seriously. Consider it seriously. If you look at that and you think, oh, I would despair. I would rather be dead. There's something far wrong about that. Is God not a companion? Is there not fellowship with Christ, even when our bodies are limited and our horizons are narrowed? Are there not spiritual joys that are possible in a hospital room, upon a sick bed, under the care of physicians? Oh, friend. There is a culture of despair and of death abroad in our land. A culture that says death is better. Death is better than a hard life. Abortion rather than struggle with a child for whose coming you feel unprepared. Euthanasia rather than the burden of a painful and a limited life. Let us not fall into the culture of despair. Would to God we had died, perish the thought, perish the thought. Life is of God, and life is always a blessing. And what a sweet thing it is when God has granted life, and when God has granted the prospect of life everlasting, and there is a savour of it here to prepare for the abundant fullness of it in eternity. If you're seeing the emptiness of your gods tonight, if you are seeing the emptiness of a world and a life without pleasures, then seek better pleasures. Seek better riches. Seek treasures that will last and satisfy when this world has burned, when this universe has been rolled up like a scroll. Seek the pleasures of God. Seek treasure with Christ. Their complaint was a wish for death, their complaint was an accusation. Listen to the accusation they bring forth. The end of verse 3. Ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Oh, how vicious. To turn on Moses and Aaron, godly men who had led them safely through the Red Sea, dry foot. And now they turn with these wicked words of accusation, with that hostility, that 
harshness of judgment, that contempt for all that they had been and all that they were as the elders and leaders of Israel. This kind of accusation is a fearful thing, and yet again you will see it when people are convicted, when people feel the depth of their own sinfulness and their distance from God. So often the response is to lash out, to turn against the church, to turn against the word of God and to spit forth bile and hatred. It is a horrible thing to hear. What is worse, it is a sin against God. You see the conclusion of Moses and Aaron regarding these fearful words, the end of verse 8. Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. What's the core sin here? Unbelief. They refuse to trust Jehovah, their covenant-keeping God. They refuse to believe that he was merciful, to believe that he saw their need, to trust that he would provide. Instead of lifting up humble, beseeching prayers for God's provision, which then would be crowned with rich and abundant answer, they chose to murmur, to mutiny against their God. What about you? If you're hungry this night, if you're empty this night, what is your response? Is it a plea to God? Is it the prayer of faith? Is it a cry that the Lord, who is a good father unto his children, who delights to give them good gifts, that your Father in heaven would remember you and provide for you? Or are you turning against one another, lashing out and disbelieving even God himself? May it not be so. Let us not be those who turn aside into sin when things are hard. If you feel the hunger, oh, let the hunger drive you to the feet of Christ. Let the hunger bring you to the throne and there you shall find that Christ is still the bread of life to those that come unto him. Oh, friend, will you lift your appeal for his salvation? Will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this night? I urge you to, for here we see that the Lord is gracious to hear even unworthy appeal. We've considered then, firstly, the complaint of hunger. Let's consider, secondly, the provision of food. The provision of food. Because it is immediate. Moses summoned Israel, verse 9, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And behold, verse 10, the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Incredible. They had sinned so offensively against God, and yet he was gracious. Is this not salvation revealed and described? The unworthy sinner coming unworthily with undeserving prayers, full and contaminated with all sorts of unbelief and sin, and yet a gracious God hearing and answering above what we could ask or even think. Here you see the mercy of God and what encouragement that is to seek his face. Then, verse 11, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh. It's striking, isn't it? He didn't even make them wait until the following morning. You shall have a special meal, even this night. You shall see that the Lord is God over the heavens and that out of the sky he can rain down meat to feed you. Shall windows in heaven be opened, said the unbelieving disciples. How could it be that this vast multitude, and the children of Israel were far more than the 5,000 
men upon the green grass. How shall it be that this multitude will be fed? But the Lord is the creator God and reigns supreme. And he is going to give an awesome demonstration of his power. And so quails come, and more, and yet more. A flock of quails so vast in number that they will satisfy and feed the thousands and the hundreds of thousands of the tribes of Israel. What an awesome miracle. What an awesome revelation of the hand of God. How should we understand this spiritually? It seems to me very significant that we have one meal of meat before 40 years of bread. One bloody meal before 40 years of bloodless feeding. Am I being fanciful here? To suggest to you that here is an indication of the necessity of Christ crucified. That one death that he must die on the cross. These quails had to die. And so throughout all the camp of Israel, there was death, there was slaughter. As the quails came down and as they were slain to be plucked and to go into the pot. Death everywhere, blood being shed everywhere. Once, this one night only, is it not so with our Saviour? He died once, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. And that having died once, that was sufficient. No more blood need be shed. And so we may enjoy day after day communion with him without death, without bloodshed. It's no mistake that around our supper table, our sacramental table, there is no shedding of blood, there is no tearing of meat. It is bread, it is a plant-based food that is shared at that table. No blood required. No death needed. Christ is sufficient. His blood is enough. One meal of quails. And then from the next morning, the miracle begins. A white thing lying on the ground like hoarfrost. Manna, they said one to another. What is it? In the Hebrew language, common, ordinary Hebrew words, what is it? And the name stuck. And for 40 years, it was the meal of what is it? Because they knew not. It was a true miracle. Various people have come forward with different suggestions of plant-based or insect-based substances that might conceivably, to their thinking, be the original form of manna. But all of them are, of course, massively unconvincing. Not one of the things that they suggest could conceivably feed so vast a multitude, could conceivably be gathered in anywhere near the proportions required. Not one of the things that they suggest has this flavour or can be cooked in this variety of different ways. Not one of these things would have the shortness of shelf life that is described here. Let us put away such thoughts from us. This is a direct miracle, an immediate provision of God. We can prove that decisively from Psalm 78 verse 25. We were just singing it, of course, a few moments ago and we sang together that Psalm 78 verse 25, man angels food did eat. The food of angels is the manna. Now, angels have not physical bodies, so I don't want you to take that too literally. But man did eat angels' food. Man did receive his provision directly from God, as the angels depend directly upon God, as they are sustained immediately from God. So here was a direct and immediate meal, manna, 
bread from heaven to feed and to sustain God's people. Oh, it does speak of Christ. It does proclaim to us the Lord Jesus in his abundance. It does speak to us of the bread of life. Him that cometh unto me will never hunger. And so day after day they did not hunger, for God gave them directly provision for their meals. The very flesh upon their bones was the gift of God. It's not awesome to think of. He fed his people. And if he fed his people so physically in the wilderness, how much more? May we look to our God to feed us spiritually, even in a day of famine, even in a day of the famine of the hearing of the word of God, even in a day of deadness and emptiness and carelessness, where there is precious little of the word and precious little hearing of the word, even yet God feeds his own. And oh, then that we would come to him for such feeding. How then does man feed upon Christ? How do we savour and taste and see that he is good? Really in three areas, in word, prayer and sacrament. Word perhaps above all, because in the word we have the full revelation and testimony of Christ and him crucified. These scriptures, these are they which testify of me, said our Lord Jesus. And all throughout scripture we find Christ. Christ in every chapter, Jesus on every page. We find our Saviour revealed. And as we get these new sights of Christ, as we discern something more of the Saviour, so that is an encouragement to us. So that is a strength as we see him as prophet, priest and king, as mediator, as redeemer, as the suffering servant, as he is now triumphant, victorious in God's right hand. So we feed our faith and encourage ourselves in his truth. So we draw near to him and experience fellowship with him. It is in the word and of course above all in the word preached because in the preaching in the public worship there it is as though God did beseech you by us ministers of the truth. It is God speaking when the scriptures are faithfully and rightly preached. It is an ambassador of Christ who speaks when a faithful minister is preaching the word of truth. And so Christ is revealed and known and fed upon in the word of God. Well, friends, I would urge you then, read the word of God. I know that sounds a very simple application, but yet, Is it not vital and fundamental? Read the word of God. You children and young people who are here, read the word of God. Once you're old enough to read independently, then take time each day to read the scriptures. Even if it's only 10 verses at a time, taking a little portion and feeding your soul from the truth. There is riches in the word of God. There is provision because there Christ is revealed as Saviour. Read the Word. Read good books. Delve deeper. Dig more and more into the things of God. And above all, come to public worship. When you can, when you're able, especially when these restrictions are lifted, come and appreciate the true preaching of the Word of Truth. Feed upon Christ set forth. The word prayer, oh prayer is a precious thing. In prayer we draw near directly to 
our triune God. We meet with God, we meet with Christ Jesus, the Saviour, and we speak with him. Above all, public prayer. It is in the prayer meeting above all that God meets with his people. And there, when we are led by the brethren to draw near to the Lord, there are particular blessings and a particular fellowship with God. But the secret place is precious also. And there are sweet times when we go into the closet and draw near to our God and find him drawing near to us. Let us not neglect prayer, but use it and value it and love it. And let us be guided in that by the psalms which God has given, the specimens and models of how to pray. The word, prayer, and the sacrament, the Lord's Supper. Let's not forget that. Let's not neglect that. I put it third. I would suggest to you that that is the order of importance, the word, prayer, the sacrament. The word, that's God speaking. Prayer, that's man responding. The sacrament, that is the illustration of the word. It is the outward proclamation by picture of that which the word has taught. But oh, what blessings are to be found in the Lord's Supper. Have we not often found it food to our souls to gather around the word with the sacrament? Let's pray to God that he would restore that sacrament in our midst. It is one thing that troubles me that at the moment I can see no sign of that sacrament being restored to us. That should be a burden upon all of us. Feed upon Christ. So we've considered firstly the complaint of hunger, secondly the provision of food. I want us to draw to a close with some broader lessons for feeding upon Christ. Seven brief lessons which we can find from looking at the manna. Instruction for us in our feeding upon the Saviour. In the first place, the manna was to be gathered. There was actual work required. The people had to go forth with their buckets and pick it up and gather it. It was not just in their vessels when they woke up like the widow of Zarephath. There was work and labour required. There's a lesson there. We have to go to the house of God, to the public worship. We have to go to the Bible and to the good books. We have to dig for the treasure hid in the field. There is work to be done if we are to feed upon the Saviour. He is easy to be found and he is willing to be found, but nonetheless, the manna was to be gathered. The manna was to be gathered collectively. It's quite obscure the way it's rendered here, uh, that every man was to gather according to his eating, verse 16, an omer for every man. And we're told the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. The meaning is a little obscure. I remember reading a sermon, I think by Spurgeon, in which he takes this to be a supernatural thing, that no matter how much the greedy gathered, they would only have an omer. No matter how little the poor little widow woman gathered, she would always have an omer. I don't think that is what is meant. The passage is quoted again in the New Testament scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, and I would suggest that this sheds more light upon it. Paul urges upon the people, for I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that gathered much had nothing over, and so on. I would suggest the meaning of the passage is therefore clarified that they shared. He that gathered much shared with the one who gathered little. 
that there was shading until all were satisfied and it came out that overall there was an omer for every person. In other words, feeding is collective. We feed together. It's not an individual thing hiding away like a squirrel gathering its nuts and secreting them in little hidey holes. No, we feed together, we feast together. And in good fellowship, that feeding, that mutual feeding, is the experience of us as we bounce off one another, our ideas, our understandings, and all mutually are fed and encouraged and strengthened. Such things are blessings. And how we long for fellowship to be restored once again. Feeding must be daily. Every day they had to go forth to gather their daily bread. It gives a lesson about contentment, doesn't it? Gathering enough for the day. That's it. And to be satisfied with that. To be satisfied with God's provision. To be content with such things as we have. Simple food, nothing fancy, nothing extravagant, but yet there was enough. And so in Christ there is abundance and fullness. Give us this day our daily bread. That must be our constant and continual prayer. Every day we have need of Christ. Every day let us feed upon him and find our help in him. It could not be kept. One day's feeding could not be stored up for the next. There's a spiritual lesson there too, isn't there? Not to be presumptuous. That because in the past we've fed deeply and richly, to imagine that we can cruise along endlessly upon the past experience. No, let us be feeding today. If we have the bodily and the mental strength, let us use it to dig into the word and to feast upon Christ and to find that he is rich and that he is abundant. In our feeding, observe the Sabbath. Consider how important the Sabbath was, that even this miraculous provision of the manna was specifically timed and ordered so that there would be a double portion on Saturday, which would last and nothing upon, a double course on the Friday rather, and nothing upon the Sabbath, which of course was a Saturday in Old Testament times, so that the people would not be tempted to go forth and to labour upon the Sabbath day. Now when it comes to spiritual feeding, of course, the principle is exactly reversed. It is not that we are not to labour and to gather upon the Sabbath day. It is precisely that the Sabbath day is our spiritual feast day. This is the day above all, set apart from the distractions of the world for us to find riches in the truth and to find savour in Christ. Oh, guard your Sabbath. Use the time well. Spend it seeking truth and seeking sights of the Lord Jesus and feeding upon his abundance. Make it a day of a double portion for your soul. They were to take it as a memorial. And as a memorial, we feed upon Christ. That is to say that our feeding upon Christ always points us back to that which he has done for us. It is a continual reminder of the grace of our God that brought the Lord Jesus to the cross and that kept him there. Feed upon Christ, remembering who he is and what he has done. And always we remember, we preach Christ crucified. It is so precious. He is the Lamb as it had been slain. Let us never forget what he did, what he gave for his people's salvation. And therefore, finally, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. But we can't give the communion just now. We cannot observe the sacrament. No, we can't. But we can have the spiritual reality. We cannot take the communal piece of bread and the communal cup 
We can take that which they signify. We can take our spiritual portion of the body of Christ. We can drink our spiritual portion of the blood of Christ. We can fellowship with him and let us therefore prize our privileges and use what we have been given and feast upon the Saviour. Oh, let these spiritual lessons from the manna warm us and encourage us to be busy, to be up and doing while it is day, to feed upon the Saviour. He is the Saviour willing to be found. My body is meat indeed. My blood is drink indeed. Oh, let us find that spiritually it is so, and it is still so and that there are riches to provide for all our need in Christ. Dear friend, don't be hungry this night. Don't go to bed with an empty stomach. Don't turn yourself to sleep feeling still unfed and empty. Christ is ready. He is waiting. His abundant provision is offered to you in the gospel. Come this night and see that he is the Saviour willing to be found. Taste and see that he is good, that who trusts in him is blessed. Amen. And the Lord bless the preaching of his word of truth. Let us conclude. Mm. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.